Good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us around the world um, as you filter in. Uh, I see the number of participants is rising quickly. So uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to introduce the launch of the 2020 Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index. And before I hand it over for the presentation by our fearless leader, Jessica Deer, I want to recall a little bit uh, about how far this team has come. My name is Rebecca McKinnon. I'm uh, the, the person who's, whose fault it is that we're here today. Um, and in 2013, I launched a research project here at New America based on what at the beginning seemed to be like a simple idea, inspired um, in part by Freedom House's Freedom on the Net Index that uh, ranks countries um, on the level of uh, uh, protection of internet users' rights. My idea was to create an analogous, analogous ranking for how well companies actually respect and protect users' rights. Now, back at that time, a lot of people were asking why we needed to do this. It was two years after the Arab Spring, and people still saw tech companies as largely liberating. The Snowden revelations highlighted the threat of government surveillance and how companies can stand up to the abuse of government power. Remember that time? But thanks to a, a few funders with foresight and the support of a broader research and advocacy community, we did manage to launch the first RDR index in 2015. And since then, this is now our fifth index and events have underscored, I think, exactly why this index is needed. I, I don't think we, we need to explain why big tech needs to be held accountable anymore. And the other just in, incredible thing is to see how much impact um, the work of our research team uh, has been having. The Council of Europe has been referring to RDR's data and indicators and thinking about future regulation as just one example. And yet another example, and I could share many others, but uh, we'll want to move on. Um, just this past year, four shareholder resolutions cited RDR index data. But while we're focusing on companies, governments really cannot be let off the hook here. And so I want to end with, with a challenge. And in fact, our findings do highlight uh, the fact that some serious government and regulatory failures are not being addressed. And people who work in the field of business and human rights might be familiar with something that has come to be known as the Freeman theorem, uh, which states that demand for corporate responsibility rises in proportion to government irresponsibility. And many companies in the index actually have low scores thanks to government policies and laws that actually compel censorship and surveillance of, of uh, political critics, um, practices that violate human rights. And uh, on the other hand, governments of the world's major democracies lack a coherent approach to regulation that would actually require tech companies to protect and respect users' rights to the fullest extent. So this year's findings actually underscore how government responsibility, including regulation is needed, but not all regulation is actually created equal. So laws need to be based on data and research, not just short-term knee-jerk politics. Regulation needs to be coherent and well-coordinated among countries that share the same commitment to protect human rights, and it must be consistent with international human rights standards. And uh, in, in our website, we have uh, more detail about our, our reg recommendations for governments too. And finally, I just want to say how proud I am to have handed over the leadership of Ranking Digital Rights to Jessica Deer, who led the production of this year's index and who's building an incredible team of dedicated professionals who will be carrying out this work. And I hope for many years to come that's, uh, uh, I hope funders, uh, you're listening. Uh, and I'm sure that the impact of this hardworking team is only gonna grow under Jessica's leadership. So thanks to everyone 
on the RDR team. Uh, as soon as I'm uh, uh, done talking, I'm going to post the link to our staff page in, in the chat for, for everyone to see. And thanks also to our, our funders um, uh, who, who continue to believe in us. And again, the full list is on our website. And with that, over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. And thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I and our whole team are thrilled to share the launch of the 2020 RDR Corporate Accountability Index with you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one second while I recapture my notes. We are a small but talented team working from the US, Europe, and Latin America. And you'll see their names in the acknowledgements and in the bylines of the pieces on the site, including on the company report cards. They, along with an incomparable network of researchers around the world, deserve all the credit and recognition for this year's incredible body of public interest research that is the RDR Index. And as Rebecca mentioned, of course, none of this would be possible without the generous support of our funders. As you know, um, next slide, please. As you know, RDR was founded by Rebecca in 2012. Um, and, and alongside the, the publication of Consent of the Network, in which she foresaw the dangers of a world in which the corporations and governments that build, operate, and govern cyberspace are not being held sufficiently accountable for their exercise of power over the lives and identities of people who use digital networks. They are sovereign, she wrote, operating without the consent of the network. Consent of the network is source code for RDR. And based on that source code, RDR now promotes freedom of expression and privacy on the internet by creating global standards and incentives for companies to respect and protect users' rights. We apply these standards to create the ranking and the Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index. Next slide, please. And just in case you need a reminder, the RDR Index evaluates the world's most powerful digital platforms and telecom companies on their disclosed policies and practices affecting freedom of expression and privacy. We look at what those commitments, at what commitments companies make to freedom of expression and privacy and how they operationalize those commitments across a range of services. We push for transparency as a way to establish a baseline of information about the policies and practices of tech companies so that stakeholders best positioned, stakeholders and our allies best positioned to use that information, such as consumer rights advocates, policymakers, investors and shareholders, researchers, journalists, code and technical auditors, and others can actually assess their performance from their unique perspectives and advocate for the change we need. We acknowledge that transparency is a first step and not the whole ball of wax. And we focus on free expression and privacy as both individual rights that enable our ability to exercise so many other of our human rights, but also because these rights are fundamental to healthy information environments, which in turn encourage robust social, economic, and political participation. In other words, these rights are critical to our individual and collective agency. Next slide, please. Here's a look at this year's RDR index by the numbers. It includes 26 companies, Amazon and Alibaba are newcomers, bumping the number of global digital platforms we evaluate up to 14. We also evaluate 12 telecom companies and we read through thousands of pages of policies on about 65 services, yielding more than 300,000 individual data points. Next slide. All told, the companies we rank span six continents, touch the majority of the world's 4.6 billion internet users, and represent a combined market cap of about 11 trillion US dollars. We rank the seven companies that, quote, control the internet and its infrastructure, unquote, according to Mozilla's latest internet health report. And these seven, along with the Chinese search engine operator Baidu and IBM, which we don't rank, also happen to be the companies who are building the rules, systems, and business models for the future of artificial intelligence, according to Forbes. Three of them, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, have spent more than half a billion dollars on lobbying US and European pol policymakers over the last decade or more. So I think it's fair to say that the data that we provide and our findings and analysis have really never mattered more. Next slide, please. 
Our standards, our methodology is grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which say that companies have an obligation to protect, respect, and remedy um, in, in their operations. Companies should make public commitments to human rights and conduct robust due diligence to identify and mitigate human rights harms and provide remedy to address negative consequences of harm should they occur. We choose this framework because it is legally binding through the conventions that have, have sort of operationalized the UDHR and because we need a global framework for companies that are operating globally and human rights is the right framework for that. Governments, in addition to their duties under human rights law, also have a responsibility, as Rebecca mentioned, to create environments in which companies can respect human rights. Our indicators, and there are now more than 58 of them in three categories, freedom of governance, freedom of expression, and privacy, are structured progressively. We start with accessibility as the baseline. Can a user easily access a policy and understand it? And then we get increasingly more granular and sophisticated as, as we progress. This year, we, entered in, we integrated into our categories a new set of indicators specifically to assess companies' policies of algorithmic systems and targeted advertising. Given the role these technologies are playing in our information ecosystem, amplifying disinformation and hate speech, and how they are driving company profits. We also engage with companies regularly throughout the process and companies score better when they engage, not because it earns them points, but because they can point, to, uh, point, us, point out sources that we may not have found. And we can highlight shortcomings in advance of the publication of the index, giving them an opportunity to clarify their policies and practices, or we hope institute new ones. Next slide, please. So here it is at long last, the 2020 RDR index ranking. Of course, most of you have seen it by now on Twitter or maybe you've accessed the website. You know that Twitter took the top spot among digital platforms for its disclosures in the freedom of expression category and Telefonica earned the top spot among telcos for its strong governance commitments. Amazon scored the lowest of any digital platform this year for poor governance disclosures and for what we found to be a lack of disclosure about platform rules and enforcement, among other things. You can read more about why these companies were best and worst in their categories and all the companies in our index in our individual company report cards and in our key findings essay. But suffice it to say that we think the top spot is really not something to brag about in an index where no company earns above 53%. The long and the short of it, the most striking takeaway from our research in 2020 is just how little companies across the board are willing to publicly disclose about how they shape and moderate digital content, enforce their rules, collect and use our data, and build and deploy the underlying algorithms that shape our world. We're facing a systemic crisis of transparency and accountability among the world's most powerful tech giants. At the root of this crisis is remarkably weak corporate governance and oversight of commitments, policies and practices affecting users' fundamental human rights to privacy, expression and information, and non-discrimination. The impact is across the globe, companies are leaving users in the dark about how their content is moderated and how their personal, personal information is collected, protected and used to drive profits. Those of you who have been watching the RDR index over the years may note that the scores seem a little lower than usual, and you would be right. New indicators introduced this year to address algorithmic systems and targeted advertising resulted in lower scores for most of the platforms we rank. On average, the drop was about five points. Next slide, please. In this graph on the left, uh, you can see that only six companies scores improved this year. Notably, all the companies that improved despite the addition of the new indicators are based outside the US and Europe. And on that note, we must also mention our disappointment in the performance of many US platforms, including Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and AT&T, most of which made only incremental changes to select policies, despite it being clearer now than ever that more holistic, systemic, and user-centered reforms to their governance, operations, and technologies are necessary. Very few companies are in credit for disclosures relating to the new indicators. So those that did score better this year made significant changes in other areas and represent some of our notable firsts. 
South African telco MTN published its first transparency report and announced a wave of additional improvements to human rights due diligence that I hope our panelist Marina Madele will tell us about more in the discussion afterwards. Mail.ru, owner of the Russian social media site VK, also published a commitment to respect users' freedom of expression and privacy rights. Emirati Telco Etisalat clarified that its policy, its privacy policy applies to all its services, and Qatar's Uridu published a privacy policy for the first time. Axiata, the Malaysian telco that provides telecom and related services to 150 million users in nine countries in Asia, published guidance on how users can protect themselves from cybersecurity risk, a commitment to privacy, and improved its disclosure process for some government demands and related due diligence. Baidu, which operates China's leading search engine, published a human rights policy, which it didn't get credit for because it was published outside the evaluation period, but it also made some improvements in governance, published some data on third-party demands, committed to limiting data collection to what is necessary for the services it provides, and improved transparency about policies and practices on security. While all these companies still fall on the bottom of our ranking, they have made notable strides and demonstrate that protecting and respecting human rights, even under some of the world's more repressive regimes, is possible when the will exists. Rebecca goes into this dynamic in more detail in her essay, Chinese Tech Giants Can Change, which looks at what's spurring the Chinese companies in our index to make human rights commitments and implement stronger privacy protections and what the limitations are. Next slide, please. We also calculated what score changes might have looked like without the new indicators, just to be fair. Still, the US platform saw the least improvement, indicating that their policy improvements stagnated between these two indexes. Seeing companies that aren't always driving the news cycle make meaning policy improvements is encouraging and ought to give their peers in the limelight some pause for thought. Next slide. Scores are one thing, but the company's collective failure to meet even our minimum standards of policy transparency puts the dangers of abusing digital power into high relief. Policy transparency affects people and companies are not doing nearly enough when it comes to demonstrating their governance commitments to human rights, specifically around due diligence and remedy. And companies are also not disclosing enough about how they shape and moderate digital content, enforce their rules, collect and use our data and build and deploy the under lying algorithms that shape our world. It's worth repeating. Next slide, please. So on our website, when you go to the ranking on the homepage, you can click on the buttons above and see the scores by category. Here are the governance scores. If you were to dig deeper, you might see a couple of patterns. Where we have um, strong scores of due diligence, um, Companies are providing evidence of conducting risk assessments to, to freedom of expression and privacy, primarily related to government demands. You'll also probably note that there's a need to broaden the scope of their risk assessments in line with our new uh, indicators to their own policies and practices, including algorithms and targeted advertising. US companies have all made human rights commitments now that Apple published its human rights policy in late August last year just before the end of our evaluation period. Next slide, please. But some really serious governance gaps remain. More companies are making commitments, but they're not doing the work they need to do to make them stick throughout their operations. You can see here that companies scored 60% on average on making an explicit, clearly articulated policy commitment to human rights, including, including free expression and privacy. But when we look at how they implement that commitment, which requires designing and implementing robust and systematic due diligence processes, their average scores fall to just 12%, which is at the bottom of the graph. What's more, providing users with opportunities to express grievance and seek remedy through a predictable process, a critical element of any human rights commitment is, is also lacking. Average scores on this indicator um, is just 25%. If you can go to the next slide, please. With the exception of Telefonica, as you can see in this chart, most companies fail to offer clear and predictable remedy to users who feel their freedom of expression and privacy rights have been violated. 
All this clearly demonstrates that while commitments to human rights are being made, they aren't being properly reinforced in practice. Next slide, please. And governance isn't just an abstract concept, as Jan Ritzak and Elizabeth Ranieris, two of our team members this year, make clear in Context Before Code, one of three featured essays that accompanies this year's index and helps interpret the index findings through the lens of current challenges. This essay looks at companies' policies during the pandemic, giving examples of good and not so good practice by companies we rank on network shutdowns, this one pictured in, in Myanmar, one of 213 government ordered shutdowns documented in 2020, and on content moderation of COVID-19 mis and disinformation. The, their takeaway is that companies would be better prepared to respond to crises like these if they committed to strong human rights-led governance in the first place, especially by implementing human rights impact assessments. They write, strong due diligence can help predict, for instance, the rise of fringe movements in social media communities or the likelihood of coordinated extremist violence moving from online spaces into real life. Yet only four companies we ranked appeared to conduct impact assessments of their own policy enforcement where these kinds of threats often arise. Next slide, please. And just in case you were wondering, this is our indicator on uh, to conducting impact assessments on algorithmic systems, pretty much crickets. There's a little bit of uh, partial disclosure, but we need more. And the next slide, please. And it's the same or actually worse for targeted advertising. Um, Facebook gets partial credit for revealing that it conducted a limited assessment of discrimination risk in their civil rights report, but it's not adequate and the report was created in the, in the context, in a specific context, so it's not systematic. Next slide, please. These are our category scores on free of freedom of expression. You'll see Twitter top this category and the ranking because of more transparency about actions it took to remove content and suspend accounts for violations to platform rules. It offers trans a lot of transparency about ad content and targeting rules and reports more data than most other platforms about government demands to censor content. It also gives more information about its bot policies than other platforms. One key pattern to note in this category is that while digital platforms were generally good about disclosing their rules for content, they didn't always back up those rules with disclosures about enforcement. And as any good rule maker knows, without enforcement, rules have no teeth. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll go a little deeper into the rules and enforcement data. We can clearly see a gap here between companies on the right-hand side of the, of the chart. And the uh, lighter green, um, or the lighter color, the greener color, I suppose, and is, is the rules. And then the second column is the uh, enforcement data. So we asked that companies clearly disclose the circumstances under which they restrict content or user accounts. And then we ask them to report data on, what, on, on those content restrictions and user accounts that violate the company's own rules. And what we can see is that more companies than previously are starting to publish transparency reports about content and account removals. But as this graphic shows, there are still significant gaps in what companies are reporting. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, and here's the overview of the privacy category. Privacy scores were seriously affected this year by the introduction of new indicators related to algorithmic systems and targeted advertising. This is simply because those systems require the processing of so much user data and do so without users informed consent. Next slide, please. If we look at access to privacy policies, we see a whole lot of color. This is the most basic indicator in this category and it looks relatively good. However, on the next slide, when we look at the next indicator, access to algorithmic system development policies, only Telefonica earned credit. No other company explains to its users how it develops its algorithms. 
Understanding how algorithms are developed is critical to understanding the level of privacy a platform affords since vast amounts of user data are used to train the algorithms that underlie these systems. Next slide, please. Well, there's of course a lot more to say about privacy. Let's move more directly into algorithmic systems and targeted advertising, since I'm probably talking too much. Here's a graphic showing what questions we ask and how they track with the algorithmic development, use, development and use processes. It comes from Moving Fast and Breaking Us All, another one of our featured essays in this year's index by Ellery Biddle and Gia Zhang that interprets the data through the lens of our most pressing challenges and dilemmas. Numerous reports have shown how algorithmic curation systems are optimized to prioritize and amplify con controversial and inflammatory content. And the targeted advertising business model rests on the ability to collect and monetize user data and then using algorithms that are de developed and deployed to drive reach and engagement, exploit that data by targeting users with tailored messages and content. Next slide, please. So it would seem that committing to human rights and the development and use of these systems, not to mention conducting due diligence around them, would be a priority. Unfortunately, that's not the case. As we saw earlier in the related due diligence indicators, and as we can see here in the chart, asking for an even more basic commitment. The companies that get partial credit are mostly ethical commitments, um, artificial AI ethics um, kinds of commitments, which aren't as strong because they're subject to interpretation and they're not legally binding. Next slide, please. On our indicator that asked specifically about algorithmic content curation, recommendation, and ranking systems, none of the companies, none of the social media services we evaluated offered adequate information about how they actually shape, recommend, and amplify user-generated and advertising content. Only Telefonica and Vodafone published explicit policies on AI and human rights. No US platform made such a commitment. Only ethical principles, as I mentioned, and uh, no other US platforms, including Apple, Facebook, or Twitter, published any overarching principles addressing how they develop and use algorithms. Similarly, despite years of research warning of the real harms, no platform in the index clearly disclosed whether it conducts robust systematic impact assessments to evaluate its algorithms for possible bias or discrimination, such as we've seen in housing ads or search results that objectify Black, Latinx, and other women of color. There is a notable lack of overarching commitments or due diligence mechanisms governing how platforms design, train, and deploy them, algorithms as well. And next slide, please. And telcos aren't off the hook either. All the telcos we rank have ventured into the mobile ad market and they're remarkably opaque across the board. Only a few offered any information on targeting rules and what kinds of targeting are prohibited. No telco offered any data on how it enforces its rules, such as ads removed or accounts suspended. And they're also vague about data collection and how data is used for targeted advertising. The lack of disclosure is clear in the telcos doing worse as a group than the digital platforms. And there are fewer higher, high performers at the top of the ranking. Meanwhile, Telefonica and Vodafone, as I mentioned, are in top spots in part because they are the only ones that publish explicit policies on AI and human rights. Our index this year covers many other issues. Government ordered network shutdowns. We have a new uh, indicator on zero rating, um, which also uh, shows very, very little disclosure. Um, we have indicators and data on data breaches and the policies of notification and around those data breaches and also prevention, bot policies, stakeholder engagement, security protocols and encryption. We hope that you'll explore um, and find the data that you need. Next slide, please. Finally, we have some pretty succinct recommendations for companies. On governance, we really need them to commit to and implement robust human rights governance that includes freedom of expression and privacy and due diligence and account for and mitigate harms from algorithms and targeted advertising. On transparency, we need you to maximize transparency. 
disclose comprehensive information about how platforms and services shape and target content and how data is accessed, used and shared and user control. Users need to have meaningful control about how their data is collected, used and shared, including information that is inferred about them or us. We need to give users options to control recommendation and prioritization of content. It is essential to our agency, as we mentioned at the top. Finally, if we can go to the, final, the next slide. I'll end again with consent of the networked and the call to action that Rebecca put at the end of her book. In closing, we know that without the tech services and platforms we rank alongside hundreds of others, the pandemic would be even lonelier, less productive, and more difficult to endure. But we have to ask at what cost? Without more transparency from the companies, we can't calculate it. If people and lawmakers do not know the specifics of how they operate, it is much harder to hold them accountable for their negative effects through smart regulation and other measures. We'll end up losing their benefits as we try to mitigate their harms. Fortunately, there's an ecosystem of actors responding to the call at the end of Consensus Network that you see here, emerging to hold tech power to account. Almost as soon as contract, contact tracing apps were being touted as easy fixes to spreading the coronavirus, to the spread of the coronavirus, privacy and anti-surveillance advocates sounded the alarm. Experts pointed to the potential for misuse of the data they were collecting and the inequities of designing public health systems around technologies not everyone can access due to the persistent global digital divide. In the wake of the police murder of George, George Floyd, Floyd, forgive me, civil rights groups led the successful Stop Hate for Profit ad boycott in which more than a thousand companies pulled their ads from Facebook, bringing the link between targeted ad systems and viral Mm. viral online hate speech into the mainstream. Meanwhile, investors and shareholders also expressed concern about environmental, social, and governance risks that tech companies pose in their portfolio selections and through shareholder resolutions. Policymakers began taking the threat of tech power more seriously, educating themselves and calling company heads to testify and formulating regulation that in some cases tries to balance the benefits of technology with human rights. Last year also saw the launch of The Markup, an investigative journalism nonprofit dedicated to watching big tech by building tools like Citizen Browser that with users permission can monitor and access, monitor across multiple accounts what content groups and ads are amplified. And Consumer Reports, the leading consumer advocacy nonprofit in the US redoubled efforts to integrate its digital standard a framework for evaluating how technologies respect consumers' interests and needs based in part on RDR's methodology into product testing of digital devices. At the end of my introduction to this year's index, I propose that if tech companies do not wanna tell the world how they work, how they profit, and how they will factor the public interest into their bottom line, we will force their hand. We must find a way to govern tech collectively for the benefit of our societies, and we cannot afford to let them govern us. And with that, I'd like to turn now to our panel discussion to talk about this growing movement with both longtime leaders in the field of consumer rights and corporate accountability, upstarts trying to tackle this challenge from new perspectives and new tools. And we're also privileged, and I think she's very brave, to have a representative from MTN Group, the South African Telco. MTN made the greatest overall improvement of any company in this year's index, and I think that is, deserve, deserves attention. So let me close this part, and let me introduce you to uh, Marta Tayado. Nabiha Sayed and Marina Madale. Um, I will give you a little bit of information about um, their bios and then we'll launch into the discussion. Um, Marta Tejado is the president and CEO of Consumer Reports. She leads America's foremost consumer organization, an independent nonprofit that works side by side with consumers to advance truth, transparency, and fairness in the marketplace. Since joining CR in the fall of 2014, Tejado has transformed one of America's most trusted brands and iconic social enterprises. 
uniting its rigorous research, consumer insights, award-winning journalism, and policy expertise to drive social impact. Marta came to CR following 25 years of experience and included executive roles in public service, philanthropy, and mission-driven nonprofit management. At the Ford Foundation, she was vice president for global communications and an officer of the board. And while there, she led strategic communications and advocacy on a range of issues in the US and around the world, including economic fairness, free and fair access to an open internet and civil rights. Next, Nabiha Sayed is the president of The Markup, a new investigative journalism startup that explores how powerful actors use technology to reshape society. Previously, she was vice president and associate general counsel at BuzzFeed. Nabiha has been described as one of the best emerging free speech lawyers by Forbes magazine. And prior to BuzzFeed, she co-founded the nation's first media access law clinic, currently in its 10th year of operation at Yale Law School. And she served as a First Amendment fellow at the New York Times. Nabiha was an associate at Levine, Sullivan, Koch and Schultz, a leading media law firm and the First Amendment. Uh, and she has worked on legal access issues at Guantanamo Bay, represented asylum seekers in South Texas, counseled on whether to publish hacked materials and spoken about misinformation at the inaugural Obama Foundation Summit. For her work, Nebiha was named a 40 under 40 rising star by the New York Law Journal in 2016. And Marina Madale is the general manager for sustainability and shared value at MTN. She is responsible for setting the strategic direction for the management of sustainability and shared value across the group, comprising 21 markets in Africa and the Middle East. Marina played an instrumental role in pioneering the first ever Pan-African Transparency Report, a key milestone in positioning MTN as an emerging markets leader in sustainability. She has worked across multiple sectors globally, including the oil and gas, energy, banking and property development across multiple countries such as Qatar, Mozambique, Botswana, Gabon, South Africa, and Australia. So with that, I first would like to ask the three of you for some of your overall reflections on the presentation or the findings actually from, from the research. And what do you think they're saying about where we are as societies and democracies and the role of corporate accountability? What struck you, what stands out, and was there anything that surprised you or anything that particularly reinforces or informs aspects of your own work? Um, let me start with Marta, if that sounds good. Hi, Jessica, and hi to my fellow panelists. It's great to be here. Um, a remarkable piece of work you just walked us through. Really, it, it's you are pioneers. This is this is foundational to what all of us have to do. And I think I would just like to say it's an honor for me to be with my fellow panelists because what you're seeing is really uh, a new frontier uh, of human rights, digital rights, consumer rights, and a new ecosystem of organizations that have to do it. When you see the scale of the problem, and you can't help but realize the scale of the problem is going to take many of us and many of us from different directions, be it human rights, civil rights, uh, consumer rights, to really attack this problem and to bend the marketplace uh, in the direction of putting people before profits. So um, that's an enormous amount of work, but it is foundational. And I guess there were a number of things that struck me. And, and I guess I'd, I'd say... Um, uh, big kudos for including algorithms. Uh, that that is that was just a game changer. I thought it, it added another layer of complexity and richness to the data. Um, and and as we know from our own research, uh, it, it's so important to begin to try to move the market in that direction. And how do you do that when they're not transparent? Um, and I think some of uh, the organizations, at least, I'm really proud to have partnered with. Uh, the markup in their first kind of investigation around the algorithms driving something like car insurance and, and really getting behind that and seeing that it has nothing to do with what you think it has to do with your driving record, but it has to do with the color of your skin, your neighborhood, your job. So all of the discriminatory um, challenges that we faced uh, in the hardware world are now part of this new algorithmic environment. 
Uh, it is not objective in any way. It really reflects some of the internal biases of the very people and companies that are um, constructing these. So lots to talk about in the algorithmic space. The second one I would say is, um, wow, Amazon, rock bottom. Uh, you know, that, that one just, that one just, uh, I, I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but I wanted to think better. And, and I wanted to think better because as we think about the environment we're in now, right? We're, we're all online, we're shopping online, and the incredible um, shot in the arm this has been for a company like uh, Amazon, when you think about it, 40 cents of every American dollar during the Christmas holidays went to Amazon. Where's the reciprocity? Where's the recognition that consumers are driving their bottom line? Uh, I, I think I think that that's to me remarkable. And, and then, of course, um, the the work that so many of my colleagues are working on is is the way you track the the profitability of of hate speech and division, divide that 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 we would be seeing companies encouraging that again uh, because it drives revenue. Uh, it it it's uh, and. and and really uh, how corrosive that is uh, to free speech and human rights. Um, so I, I would just conclude and pass it on to, to my colleagues that uh, I, I think what this shows is something that Consumer Reports have been working on for a very long time. We've been around for 85 years. Most of you, um, at least I, I hope most of you, uh, think about us when you uh, look for a product or a service in the marketplace. And, and as proud as we are for that 85 years of service to consumers, we now are on the next frontier, as I said, of rights uh, because we have digital connected products. And so that's why we stood up the digital lab because it's so important. And because we maintain that, you know, benchmarking does change behavior and it does move and shape the marketplace. And that's what this enterprise is really about. It, it, is, it is a theory of change that we have been squarely in with you for a very long time, but now we've got to figure out what are the tools because as you say, there is no transparency here. So how do you do that in a world where the software is driving so many of the harms that we can't see? So I'll stop there because I'd love to hear from my colleagues. Great, Nebiha, would you like to go next? Sure, I would love to jump in with the praise. This report is tremendous. I wanna underscore what Marta said, including targeted advertising and algorithmic decision-making here as a focus was, I mean, inspired and the subject of much shock for me. I, from where I sit, those are topics that folks have been talking about a lot for the last couple of years. And so to see that not a single company in the index assessed expression or privacy risks related to those categories. What, honestly, like I didn't think it was gonna be great. Okay, but I thought it would have one in the portfolio. And I think that that was uh, something that indicated just how much work we have to do, right? And so, so charitably, I might say that companies in this space are, don't know what disclosure transparency might look like, right? So we have to figure out what is the framework that we want? Is it something like a generally accepted algorithmic auditing principles, much like principles that we have in the accounting sphere. Is it something else? What does that look like? You know, I think there's a, there's room for imagination and demands in, in that space. Cynically, I would say when it comes to targeted advertising and uh, algorithmic decision-making that they're so core to the business models of many of the companies in the index that we're not going to find out a lot unless it's mandated. And I think, you know, either way, whether you take the charitable take or the cynical take, or I'm sure other takes we'll get into in, in, in this panel, I think we're seeing that the limits of voluntary disclosure are pretty clear. And um, the avenues I'm excited about going forward is, you know, what does regulatory intervention look like? I think a lot of people are thinking about that space. Um, and there's a number of tools that uh, at, at regulators disposal to figure out that way forward. At the markup, um, we focus a lot on external independent third party monitoring because we think no matter what corporations might voluntarily share, there is room for that independent assessment 
um, because of the sort of independence and different outside perspective it provides. And I think the third piece, and this is where I think, you know, being on a, a panel with Marta and with a brand like Consumer Reports is just so uniquely exciting is I, I think the way forward in educating consumers in moving the marketplace and saying, this isn't a set of foregone conclusions. There is something that can be done here because you deserve more is a really important opportunity and moment. And I think consumers are ready to hear that. They have brands that they trust that are helping educate them in, in that realm. And I think all of these three pieces are sort of working together will help move us forward. But I'm very excited to, to hear from the experience of RDR in, um, in, in moving things forward in other realms. Like I was also heartened to see that, you know, in 2017, when you asked folks about data breaches, only three people responded saying, we have, we, here's our policy and procedure. And in 2020, you have 13, right? Which is making some headway. And so I think we can also look to your learnings because you've been in this space doing the rigorous work for so long to see what, what levers of change work, what might not, and who else we need to go to. So thank you again for a great report. Thank you. And, and I think I would be remiss in not sort of talking a little bit about uh, the algorithms and adver targeted advertising indicators, um, that, that that was something that was a process that took us about two years to sort of go through and, and develop those indicators, primarily led um, by Natalie Marichelle. Um, and uh, working with our research director, Amy Brulette and others on the research team. Um, and that it, it was, again, another sort of prescient moment, I think that um, I wasn't at RDR at the time, but, but to sort of identify that we needed to develop indicators around those, those tools and then took the time and, and there was significant stakeholder engagement, including with companies in the development of those indicators. So Marina, um, Thank you so much for being on the panel. As I said before, I think it's it's we're we're delighted to have you. It's probably quite brave um, being a company representative on a panel like this. Um, but you know, MTN was the most improved company this year, and so there's a there it's a it's a great example of of what we can do when when there's a will. So I wonder, I'd love to hear some of your reflections on on the index, but also. Um, you're on the process of, of sort of being evaluated like this and, and how it has affected or, or had an impact on your policies and, and, and uh, putting human rights sort of at the center of your work. Thanks, Jessica. So I think as you mentioned, um, MTN is um, operating in emerging markets, very unique, very dynamic um, across Africa and the Middle East. And, Every day we are, you know, um, challenged in terms of how do you continuously evolve. So as um, as you mentioned earlier, that you know you, the score gets better when you engage. Um, and so you know, RDR has been absolutely phenomenal. I think the evolution, as uh, the panelists said, of the index is is incredible. Um, and I think I. I think definitely algorithm zero rating, especially when you look at the year that we've had, um, that's been a very strong feature. And the question becomes as, as mobile operators, what role are we playing? Are we putting the necessary measures in place? So that really stood out. I think as we go forward, um, you know, I challenge RDR to think of um, AR, uh, you know, the effects of artificial intelligence blockchain and so forth. So I think it definitely, um, I think it's, 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 a gr it's great work. And I think you'll be able to build on that foundation going forward because more is happening and technology is advancing with introduction of, of 5G and everything. So we continuously need to think of, you know, what does human rights look like in that space? So I, I commend um, RDR. As an organization, I think, um, engaging with the team fundamentally helped us to, you know, understand um, where we're at, what's required and so forth. And I think one of the key things where um, digital human rights is concerned is that it's a, it's a journey um, and it, it, it's almost basically, it's not a hundred meter sprint. Um, you have to put the building blocks and keep build, building on it and that, and, um, you know, RDR really helped us with that. And that's why you see that we put the time and the effort 
made sure we um, worked within our multidisciplinary team because it takes everybody to help um, protect human rights. And, and so I think that was one of our key learnings out of the process. And that part of that evolution is really what led to us um, deciding to continuously enhance our systems, our processes, um, governance, and also um, that really was one of the things that led to us uh, developing our first ever transparency report, which we're extremely proud of. Thank you. That's fantastic, Marina. I wonder if I could, excuse me, pick on you a, a little bit more and 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 ask um, sort of how, I'd love to just hear more about MTN's approach and sort of how is it making a business case for human rights, both inside the company uh, as well as outside the company? Um, where is this will to sort of align with the standards that have been created to do a transparency report um, and, and improve your policies? How is it being driven within the co company? You said you have an, an interdisciplinary team. Um, how does that work? Yeah, seems so, like you have a model. <laughs> uh, we, we're still learning, uh, but thank you. Um, I think the key to it all is really building knowledge and understanding. Obviously, aspects like um, digital human rights may be seen to be restricted to particular departments or be seen as an abstract concept uh, where you'll read in the media or you'll get approached to to, uh, to ask questions, where people ask you questions, but largely it comes down to each and every person and organization. So the very fundamental key has been just building the understanding of why is it important um, and then getting everyone on board to say, okay, what systems or processes do we need to have in place? And what you find, and, and that I found also was interesting from the research you presented, uh, was the gap between um, commitment and implementation. Um, and I think what you find is that a lot of um, a, a lot of organizations are actually doing a lot, but they don't necessarily disclose it. And I think that's the heart of and the importance of, of RDR is, is really looking and saying, okay, have we disclosed this? I think even engaging with the team, um, the simplicity of how you put the information is fundamental. And I think that, uh, you know, we had quite a lot of discussions with, with Jan and the team just around, you know, we, like how many clicks does it take to find your terms of service, you know? Uh, and so you really learn a lot from that, just to say, just make it easier for your consumers, make it easier for your stakeholders. So it definitely, I think, takes a concerted effort. It takes a multidisciplinary team. And then I think it takes um, support from the top. And I must say, and, and commend uh, our group president and CEO, Ralph Mupita, who's 100% um, committed. He spends the time, he engages. And, and I think that, that, that really, if you get the, the, the tone from the top right, um, everything else comes right. And we found that um, our stakeholders engage with us in digital human rights quite a lot. Um, they ask us, you know, tell us more, share your policies. Um, uh, and, and a lot of them have actually reached out and commended us for the transparency report in particular. Fantastic. Um, I guess I would like to go to uh, Nabiha. I'll go back the other way this time and, and say, uh, ask you about Citizen Browser. Um, it's uh, Citizen Browser captures snapshots of, of what um, I think some volunteer, like 2,000, more than 2,000 volunteers um, see in their Facebook feeds um, and you've released uh, data from the browser. I wonder if you could sort of tell us what the report covers and a little bit more about sort of the technical auditing because one of the things that RDR is very um, clear about is, is that we evaluate what companies say about what they do, what their policy disclosures are, and see an opportunity, but we don't evaluate actual practice or what the actual outcomes of those policies or operation, operational policies are. And so we see an opportunity for um, networks of organizations like ours to work together to kind of fill in the gaps. 
And so technical auditing, um, the kinds of auditing sort of code work and invest data, data driven investigative journalism that the markup does is providing yet another data set um, that when combined with RDR data and perhaps consumer data and other sorts of things that we would be able, not consumer personal data, but data about consumer habits and, and um, from consumer reports would actually sort of start to map um, or uh, yeah, tell us what these companies are doing that they're not telling us themselves. Yes, absolutely. So I think that's right. I think this is a network, this is a team effort, right? And everyone's sort of coming at the transparency in different ways. There's the voluntary disclosures made by the companies, which are great. Then there's the evaluation of how well is that encoded in the actual policy, which places like RDR are jumping into. And then there's folks like us at the markup. And for those of you that don't know, we are a nonprofit newsroom. Tomorrow is actually our one year anniversary of publishing. So what a wild first year it's been. Um, and we have sort of a simple and radical proposition at the heart of the newsroom, right? The public deserves to know exactly how technology governs their lives and what they can do about it. And so to get that full picture, right? Sometimes you have to look at the system that perpetuates harm, not just anecdotes that result from it. And so, because what happens is this game of whack-a-mole, right? You identify some harm, you tell the company, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, here's a blog post. And then everyone goes on their way and we're not really persistently monitoring. So we thought, well, why don't we actually try to build some efforts to persistently monitor? And this is really the beautiful brainchild of Sir Yamatu, one of our engineers and Julia Angwin, our editor in chief, who's been in the realm of algorithmic accountability for, for so long. And, and they set out to answer a pretty straightforward question, which is, what is Facebook recommending to its users? Just what is it, right? We should check. And so, as you mentioned, we've got 1900 panelists who decided to download a browser that we built um, that would allow them to volunteer their data to us so we can track what is Facebook recommending to this panel. Um, and it has been, fascinating, right? Not only for being able to track some misinformation that's moving around, but also giving us the opportunity to note where Facebook did not live up to a promise that it made to Congress. It told Congress that they were going to stop recommending political groups in advance of the election um, and during the transfer of power. And we, using our national pa panel data, two of our reporters saw that actually um, 12 of the top 10, top 100 political groups or uh, groups that were recommended in December, right after the election, during the transfer of power, which of course we were all very worried about, uh, were actually political groups. They were explicitly political groups and worse, they were being targeted to Trump voters, which of course were, uh, served, served a lot of misinformation in, in this time. And so it helps to build these systems, right? Th this way to monitor, to just check in real time, in real life, are we all living up to the promises that we're supposed to? Um, and I think that that's really important. It's expensive. It's slow. You know, I will joke that what it costs us to build Citizen Browser is like a dev and a half at Facebook, right? So there's definitely a scale question here of what does it mean to have a bunch of TIE fighters going up against Death Stars? You'll have to forgive the early Star Wars reference, but you know, um, but that kind of infrastructure is what we're trying to build. And, and so we can build those tools and have people participate. We also think of that infrastructure um, in terms of decentralizing the tools so we can put it in the hands of consumers, which I think is a helpful uh, last piece that I'll mention. We built a tool called Blacklight, which anyone can use. You can go to the markup.org slash blacklight, put any website into it and it'll show you the invisible trade that takes place when you load a page. So if you go to purinadogfood.com or whatever place you decide to spend your money, you'll see what the canvas fingerprinters are, what the trackers are, what's going on, like what are the cookies on that page in that interaction. And I think that's important too, because we wanna equip consumers with the ability to also call out when something curious is happening, right? If someone says, you know, I loaded this website, what is going on here? Let me reach out to my university and ask them, why is it that the Twitter embed function allows, it sends all this information to you? Do you need it, right? That what we're doing is we're actually giving the public, we're sort of making them our agents and also keeping those companies accountable, educating themselves and making good consumer choices. So at the markup, we're sort of thinking about tools and infrastructure as a way 
to help the accountability game move forward. But we really, we need folks, we need folks like you to be able to do it. I think we all need each other. I'm, I'm really intrigued by the, the scale question. Um, I, as you were describing it, I couldn't help but think this is one of the things that we also struggle with a lot at RDR. Um, when we first started publishing the index in 2015, we ranked 16 companies and now we're ranking 26. And um, the research process is rigorous. Uh, it takes a long time, about six months, I think from June until October, we did the research for this index last year. And, um, and so one of my questions is just sort of, as you noted, you, know, you're, you have Citizen Browser and it's specifically for Facebook. How do we scale this work? And, and I think one of your solutions about engaging uh, users is a good one. And it's something that, again, we're also thinking at RDR is how do we make our methodology um, into a tool where companies or groups can, can use that to do their own assessments or to assess themselves? Um, and so I want to turn to Marta, where Consumer Reports has been doing this for 85 years and has really figured out, at least to some extent, some of the scaling issues of this kind of work. And I wonder what we can learn from you in this sort of new digital corporate accountability um, environment. Well, I, I want to stay on this Star Wars metaphor and say that I think we've established that there is a disturbance in the force and um, there's no question, right? So, so we've got these scrappy, you know, uh, pilots here that are trying to figure this out and boy, the scale question is tremendous. So I want to break it apart into two pieces. I want to touch on some of the amazing, um, comments that Marina made uh, around something that, you know, um, uh, around culture, really. And, and to be here, you talked about trust. So for, for like a research, um, you know, data geek like, like we are, um, I, I, I don't think those two concepts should be dismissed. This notion of the culture, corporate culture and, and trust and how consumers really um, can define the strength of, of, of a brand by how much they trust it. And, and I, I think those are important concepts. But to go to the scale question, uh, Nibia, Nibia, you said the same thing. The kind of investigative data journalism that the markup is doing and that CR is doing, it's expensive. It, it does require resources to be able to go down these rabbit holes and put these pieces together in, in a very scientific data-driven way, in a nonpartisan way, and in an independent way. Because at the end of the day, that is our big, that is a real strength of ours, is that we have to go to, to, to decision makers, to corporate giants um, with impeccable credibility about our data and our research. You know, the comparative testing, when we do testing, it's not, does this product feel better than the other? Do you like this color versus that? It is not about that. Right, it, it's taking you behind around issues of safety, control, privacy, security. Those, it, the, the scale and the complexity of these products is much greater than what we've seen in the past. And so, so we've got to figure out how, you know, how we're gonna do some of that. And, and part of what we did in the digital lab was really open ourselves up, have an open framework where other partners can come to that framework and help us define how do we create standards? Because what was so fascinating, the day that we announced our, our digital standard, we had a number of corporations immediately call us and say, what are you doing? How are you doing it? What are the standards? How do we meet them? You know, how, how high do I need to jump to, to, to be number one? So I, I guess, you know, we've been at it 85 years. There is enormous amount of consumer um, uh, power that I think consumers have that can be a catalyst for change. They're a sleeping giant. We have to educate them. But as Nabiha said, they also need the tools. And, and that's um, that kind of innovation um, and ability. You know, we, we've, we've developed some privacy tools as well um, to, to help consumers. But again, 
Uh, it's that scale. So yes, we would like to see when you get your TV and you bring it home uh, that, that it is not recording what you are doing, that you don't have to actively, you know, the burden is all on consumers in these products when you bring them into your home. What do you have to do to secure your home? It shouldn't be that way. They should be designed with consumer preferences in mind. And one of the strengths I think that we can continue to bring is that we are in the marketplace every day surveying millions of consumers. What are consumers' needs? And we need companies to be responsive to those needs. And, and that takes me to, to Marina and MTM. Boy, I wish we had more American companies that were modeling the kind of uh, um, really a culture that you're describing because it is that, it is a culture a culture that creates change. And I, so, so I, I don't wanna over rotate, um, you know, because as I said, we're, we're data geeks, but this notion that uh, a combination of culture and leadership along with the data and consumer needs that need to be met, I think is, is also a game changer. So I, I'm really glad that you raised that. And then I'll just uh, say a little bit about trust. Uh, again, we know that uh, by looking at data over time, that there is a lack of trust and it's, it's declining rapidly in our political institutions, in corporate companies, um, and, and in our elected officials, right? So, so now we're seeing uh, more lack of trust in the platforms. Now, that's a turning point for us. You know, I, I, think, I think we've been doing a lot of educating we have been seeing a lot of hacking, the reporting that Markup's doing, um, companies that are set trying to set new standards. I think we're at, a, we're, at a, we're at a crossroads here where I think we need to really turn the corner on this and, and we're seeing it. We saw it just you know last night in California with the net neutrality ruling that came out of the courts. We saw it at this, in California as well with consumer privacy laws, but all of this has to be put to the test. And, and so um, I'll, I'll, you know, to your question, Jessica, what, what have we learned? Well, not only do products and services have to be put to the test, so do these government laws have to be put to the test. So how do you do that? One of the things we did was we asked consumers to go ahead and try to test that uh, as wonderful as, and as proud as we are to see California's privacy law, just how easy is it to opt out? And, and what we found with 500 consumer volunteers that actually actively tried to stop control and to take control of their privacy, 62% of them were like, this was almost impossible. But we couldn't figure out, we couldn't even get the company to confirm that what I just did really, so, so total lack of customer service, not putting consumers first. So I think I think it's all those things. It's it's. We have to engage consumers. They're a sleeping giant. Um, I think they're, that, that the ecosystem is doing a terrific job. I think um, some of the companies we know um, are uh, the lack of policing and uh, of self-policing. We know that, that that is not a game changer. So we've got to address the market failure and the government failure. And, and, I, and I think we have to recognize uh, the power that consumers have and, and how do we begin to, um, to really work together to make that happen, whether it's the readership of the markup, whether it's companies that are modeling that yes, this can be done. Um, so I, 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 think, I think we're at a really important moment. I knew I would do it once in the in the session. <laughs> so you would think after a year, I'd know how to mute and unmute properly. Um, but thank you, Marta. That's a really eloquent sort of um, uh, discussion of sort of where we are and what the space is. I'm wondering um, from Nibiha, how, what is your engagement with companies look like, and and what kinds of impact are you feeling from um, the markup and and citizen browser? It's a great question. So by virtue of being journalists, right, we maintain sort of this external independent independence is our guiding star always. And so we do engage with the with companies when we go to them and say, here are our findings, what do you have to say, right? We're not in the business of 
gotcha journalism. We want to hear if there's a countervailing explanation for this set of facts. We want to hear it. Um, and, and that's a core part of what we call our markup method, right? We want to bulletproof our results before we share them with, uh, with our readers. Um, but beyond that, beyond sort of hearing what they have to say, incorporating it with the facts that we have, and then sharing that with the public, there isn't a lot of cooperation other than we serve we serve the consumers, we serve the public, we serve our readers, and we're going to we're going to audit from the outside, right? We can be the barbarians at the gate, we're not going to necessarily be on the inside working, understanding that all of these are different theories of change. Mm -hmm. um, I am as a, now putting up taking off my markup hat and putting on my like curious lawyer hat. I am fascinated to see if we'll see more companies who actually ask for some form of regulation. And I, I think specifically about one op-ed by Jeff Glick, who was at the time the CEO of Foursquare. And it was an op-ed in the New York Times. And Foursquare, a location data company that you know collects data from all pe people checking into different restaurants and locations, he said, you know, we should we need to regulate location data. And here's why. The, game of trying to figure out compliance in 1 million di different jurisdictions is just too much. If we had clear standards, then it would be, there's a business case right here. And of course, there's all sorts of downstream questions of, well, then what role do lobbyists play? Do the regulations actually have the teeth they need to? Well, we can get to that. But I'm really curious, of, in, as Marta said, we're in this very special moment. And as Marina's presence on the panel and her great remarks indicate we have companies who want to do the right thing, whether we're going to see that sort of voluntary, like, can someone help us give us guidance happen in this moment? I think that's a really interesting um, thing to keep an eye on. I'm very, very curious to see how that unfolds with the companies, especially in the RDR portfolio index. Thanks. I'm, I can't help but ask, um, given the, the one page ad on we support regulation from Facebook and in, in the New York Times that was circulating on Twitter, sort of what, you know, what you're, when you hear companies asking for regulation, do you feel that it's only like in their self interest? Or is it also, do you think there's room, I guess, is what I'm saying for common interests there? Um, in terms of, of you know, Foursquare saying it's easier for the business case, but also is there a human rights case that, that, that they would respond to? And maybe that's a question for Marina as well. Um, I would love to hear Marina's thoughts on this, but what I'd say is, you know, I think it goes to the principle that Marta illustrated. It's the trust question, right? Mm -hmm. If these companies feel like trust in them and their success that flows from it is predicated on doing the right thing, or at least, inching closer to the right thing, then I think there is room for that sort of common common interest to evolve. But I think we need to sharpen that proposition. And I think this is where it's, you know, consumers, users come into play, government maybe nudges things along, corporations play, and really a lot can happen out of that interplay. Um, that doesn't necessarily, I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily entirely cynical about this. I think it is possible. I think it picks up on a little bit of the scale question we were talking about, which is who is a lion on behalf of the consumers in the way that lobbyists can be for many of these corporations? And, and how do we make sure that plays out in a way that's equitable and fair and make sure that everyone's at the table in the, in the way they should be? And so I'd have those set of questions, but with that, I'm very curious about what Marina's thoughts might be. Thanks. Marina, do you wanna take that on? I'll try and add a bit. Um, so I think I definitely, um, uh, like both Martha and Abiza, that we um, look at trust as a key factor, um, especially for us as corporates. So if you, if you look, for example, at the Edelman Trust Barometer, you see uh, that trust plays a huge factor. You see which um, sort of stakeholder groups is, is, is most trusted and Corporates are still there within trust, but I think um, that trust is starting to erode. So we need to definitely um, look at mechanisms. And I think it really is about uh, listening and being responsive. I think that that's part uh, ways in which to build trust. Um, ourselves as MTN, we run an annual uh, reputation index survey, and we've been looking at some of the results of that survey 
And when you listen to uh, our stakeholders, you find that um, you know the we look at various parameters. So we look at reputation, relationship, health, and trust. And we understand that there's different dynamics to it. But at the end of the day, it's about how do we respond as as corporates because um, communities um, and and various stakeholders still hold a lot of trust. Um, towards us, and we have a responsibility at the end of the day, you know, so I think that's the key thoughts on that. Fantastic. Um, since we're about 15 minutes away from the end of the session, uh, we're starting to get some questions from the audience uh, roll in. And um, Marina, the first question is for you. Um, I suppose I'm supposed to say who it's coming from because his name is here, but from Peter Mysek at Access Now, who I'm sure you know. Um, are there updates to MTN's human rights policy or implementation processes coming, including on substantive issues like internet shutdowns? Um, what can we expect as MTN explores this new territory and can you connect it to any lessons learned from your transparency report and best practices for other companies who might be watching you closely? Sure. So um, Peter, definitely we, we know very well um, and uh, we look forward to keep engaging with. Um, what we find is that, uh, as I mentioned, there's dynamics in our markets. So updating our policies is an annual continuous thing. So I think Peter will be very happy to see on the system uh, and you could go to our website right now, you will see the 2020 um, revised policy. And the goal is to update it absolutely every year, because especially when you look at the transparency report, we learned a lot from it. Um, we picked up that, you know, um, yes, there were instances of, uh, of um, sort of uh, freedom of expression related um, internet shutdowns and so forth. Um, what we found was that when you looked at the data uh, in terms of the volume, it was a lot less, uh, but what you find is that you can act of it. So we definitely uh, continuously monitor. And I think that's part of um, uh, instilling the and implementing our due diligence framework. So that's something that we work with every single market. And I think very soon after we, we signed off on the policy, we actually had a few cases where we had to go step by step with the markets to make sure that we follow the due process. Some of our observations on, on the transparency, what we learned was that um, you're finding both citizens uh, and governments actually exercising their rights. Um, so you uh, at least, um, I think if I remember some of the research was, at least 60% of the requests that came in from um, civilians was largely uh, requests for civil litigation cases. So people are, are, are contacting mobile operators, they're wanting to get the information and so forth. And then 40% of that is really for their own personal use, whether they're applying for visas and so forth. So you find that a lot of these requests are, are, are predominantly um, within, that, uh, within that space. So I think if, if we speak to what are we learning is that it is a journey, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so we, we, we are now um, uh, at, with the transparency report having been um, concluded, we continue to evolve, take stakeholder feedback. It's been really useful. So we appreciate the comments by Access Now, the comments by RDR and many, many other stakeholders that have reached out and we literally are taking each of those comments on board. Um, we continue to engage we're very open um, in terms of that. And I think uh, we, we also planning to venture into uh, doing a digital human rights impact assessment as part of our next step. So I think, I think that's the key to any um, mobile operator out there is that you need to be able to be clear on your reality in, 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 in your operating environment. Um, you need to take into consideration um, the regulations, how the trade-off and, and sometimes the balance um, that takes place between international standards and, and, and local regulation, local laws. Um, and obviously as organizations, and I think we got a lot of questions around Sudan um, uh, in particular last year. And I, 
I think what made me, and I think a lot of uh, stakeholders commented and said, but you're silent. Um, and they didn't realize there's a lot of things that's happening in the background. And we're very pleased that we were able to share the case study uh, last year. And, and things that people didn't know was that MTN was the last to shut down and the very first to, to actually uh, come back on to the point where customers were going out talking about it. And also, uh, most importantly, what most people don't know is that we worked in the background to try and reduce the time period, um, look at uh, engaging different stakeholders. So there's a lot that sometimes you're not able to speak about in the moment, but then you know, as, as you come to report and you get your stakeholders, uh, stakeholders around the room and you find the way to, to do it in a way that's possible, that is safe for, for um, everyone involved. You know? So I think um, it's a journey. And, everyone just needs to take a step at a time and continuously improve. And I think that's why um, RDR uh, index and, and stakeholder feedback is absolutely fundamental to continuous improvement. Thank you so much, Marina. That was really, really enlightening. Um, our audience is being very kind and has a question for both Marta and Nabiha. So one, one question for Marta, one for Nabiha. Uh, Marta, the question to you is, do you think consumer preferences are not being taken into account by companies because customer data is at the heart of their business model? And, and do you think, sorry, one, do you think that um, customers can successfully push back if the sleeping giant wakes up? Do we have enough consumer power? I guess is the question. <laughs> yes, that's a great question. I'll, I'll take the consumer preference one first. Well, it's, it's um, when you have monopolies, consumer preference is not at the top of your, your, your sort of checklist, right? Because if, if consumers lack the choice, then um, it, it, that, that lever is, is difficult uh, for, for consumers uh, to, to pull. So I think, I think what we, uh, that, that is some of the ways in which uh, we've seen real government regulatory failures is that we have got Goliaths and we've got many Davids. And we, we, this is only gonna work if we all work in tandem. You know, we, we do not have an agile, and I'm speaking in the American context, and of course this is, you know, when you think globally, it, it's, it's, even, it's, it's really challenging. We do not have a government, we didn't, think about it, in the analog world, they were slow. In the digital world, there's there's so much that is blowing past that consumers are not being factored into, and so um, yeah, the, the, these monopolies are are writing the preferences. And when you don't have a lot of choice, uh, whether you want to get off of Facebook or your Amazon, it, it's very difficult for a consumer to feel empowered. So I think uh, one of the ways. Um, uh, and I guess this, the, the second half of that question was, um, remind me, that was... It was, was um, do, do you think that consumers can successfully push back if the sleeping giant wakes up? Absolutely. And, and they have historically. Think about it. Um, when, you know, think about the environmental movement where chemicals were being spewed in every which way. I mean... You know, all of us were really young kids then, right? And but but this was happening also. These these products that you could not see, that you could not feel or touch or inhale, were miraculously the basis of so many things that were seeping in. We have a very different kind of lack of transparency now. Now we're in a digital world where all of these products and ways in which we have become uh, the the product is not transparent to us. And so again, I, I, we go back to that, we, we've got to show and help consumers and work with consumers, not just for them, to really understand how this impacts your everyday life. It, how it's shaping the choices, the things you see on the internet, what's being blocked from you, how you have absolutely no agency and how some of the things that you cannot even control, things that are mandated, like you have to go out and get car insurance. And there's an algorithm that's driving that. You need a mortgage. 
You need a student loan. What are the algorithms driving that? We even uncovered you know, uh, um, medical algorithms that block certain patients from getting in line for a transplant. How do you how do you feel empowered with things you cannot see? And I think it's it's a very interesting parallel to the chemicals that are seeping into that seep into our society as well. So so what I think what I really want to stress is this notion that consumers, government, and the corporates we we have to shape our future. And right now, people have not been at that table, right? And we know that self policing is not working. We know that our government doesn't understand. It is lacking some fundamentals around how do we address this new breed of titans in the market that, that are not providing choice or competition. I mean, we have always been for a healthy marketplace. So I think, I think we're tired of waiting for the product and then dinging it when it fails. We have to get that. That's yesterday's way of, of accountability. We've got to think about the future. The future of accountability is being at the table and having upstream impact, not waiting till a digital product comes on the market and by then it's too late. And so, so I, I really feel like, you know, the way in which we're going to have power in the future is being at the table, having voice, having choice, but also having the power, right? So we've got to do our job to reveal the truth and grow consumer power if we're going to have impact. Fantastic. Thank you. And Nabiha, the question for you is what can journalism more broadly do to support citizens and consumers uh, and consumers to hold corporate power to account? So part of the equation that Marta was just talking about, what is journalism's role um, in, in that process? I want to stand up and like put my fist in the air after Marta is rousing um, uh, framing of it. And so I'll pick up on the on those threads. I think for the public to be at the table, journalists go into the room and turn the light on, right? There's a lot that we don't know. And I think about a work at the markup in sort of these categories of like the tech, you know, right? You know that you should probably know a little bit more about Facebook's content moderation, or why is Amazon serving the like these same sweatpants to me over and over again, and who's profiting from them? What's happening here? But there's the tech that you don't know, right? And so I think about our launch story exactly one year ago with Consumer Reports about car insurance algorithms. There's tenant screening algorithms, as Marta mentioned. There's the algorithms and the tech you don't know, and there is just so much to be done on that frontier to like just turn on the light, say this is what's happening. Is this the world that you want? If not, I really believe that we can rouse the public to say we demand better, right? And as I could not have put it more eloquently than Marta, that like we've done it in the past. I'm so bullish on what that type of people power is capable of doing in this moment. And I would say it's consumer as consumers having choices and also being at the table. It's all there's a really interesting dimension at this moment too of what's happening inside of companies. When you think about Google and what their workers are saying, like, we don't wanna work on this. We don't wanna do that, right? That's a really interesting slice of people power too that is happening in this moment that I would say they're, at, they're also at the table in an interesting way. And so I think what journalism's job is, is to show that this is, this is what's happening and to remind people that like a different world is possible. Right, I think a lot about the role of imagination and helping people imagine like a different future is possible. It doesn't have to be this way, right? And so I was, um, I was reading this great Brookings report paper about algorithmic accountability. I think it came out last week, and they referenced that one of the regulators for the railroads back in the day, right, a hundred years back started off with transparency, saying, hey, railroads, we need to understand more about what you're doing here. And transparency is that step towards whether it's regulatory change or whatever form of change it is, you first have to know what the problem is first before you can do anything about it. And I think that's what journalists do a tremendously good, uh, good job in doing. Now, it is an industry in great turmoil. So if there are journalists and outlets that you love, please do support them because they're doing really tough work, but the work that we all need to do together. Thank you, Nebiha. 
And we're at the hour. So I think instead of doing sort of around around the horn uh, sort of um, wrap up, I'll just try and highlight some of the key points because you're all so inspirational. Um, one is openness. And I think the open source of the markup of the RDR methodology of Consumer Reports Digital Lab and also the transparency reports of MTN are all, and, and just sort of your openness about your process, Marina, are all things that, that need to be in any process um, or in, in our sort of movement towards more corporate accountability. Corporate culture is, is a big driver of change. I'm hearing um, trust uh, and listening and being responsive, um, that there are multiple theories of change in our space and that we need to knit them together in a way to, to create the sort of force and the power that we're talking about and to sort of equalize some of the asymmetry that we're experiencing right now. Um, one is that we all are facing challenges of scale, I'm sure. Um, the, the cost of doing transparency work um, in the way that, that RDR consumer reports and the markup are doing it is, is quite high. So hopefully our funders are listening. And, and also, you know, because we also don't take corporate funding as RDR and I, I don't know exactly the policies of CR and, and the markup, but, you know, in order to preserve that independence, we also have to make some um, compromises and quote unquote sacrifices. Um, that regulation is coming and that consumers uh, and users and people um, who are affected by all of these tools and technologies need to be at the table. Um, finally, uh, I really like the idea of the tech you know and the tech you don't know and that the algorithms and the, and the big data processing and the target advertising is the tech we don't know that we need to understand better. And I think the RDR index this year does a really good job, if, if I can say that, of sort of illuminating that and just how much we're not being told. So with that, I'll close. I wanna thank um, all of the panelists, Marta, Nariha, and Marina. Thank you so much for your engagement and participation and observations and insights. Thank you to our audience um, for staying and thank you to the RDR team and New America for helping us uh, launch the 2020 RDR Index. Uh, hope you'll all visit it online. Thank you.